Hello and welcome to Money Matters. My name is Dave Emery. I'm with the Marshall Financial Group. Uh, before we get started on today's show, I want to read our disclosure agreement. Marshall Financial Group is an SEC registered investment advisor with its principal business place of business in Doylestown, Pennsylvania. For additional information about Marshall, please request our disclosure brochure as set forth in Form ADV using our website www.marshallfinancial.com or refer to the Investment Advisor Public Disclosure website, which is www.advisorinfo.sec.gov. Any information on today's show is not intended for personal advice. Uh, my co-host today is is uh, Michael Zarnak. Carwick. Carwick, I'm sorry, with, with Sa Sa Simone Zajac Wealth Management. Welcome, Michael. Thank you very much, Dave. All right. So uh, tell me a little bit about, about your practice and what, you, what you're seeing today. And actually, since you covered your disclosures, I'll remind our okay. viewers of one additional thing, which okay. is that the views that we express today are our individual views and not necessarily the views of our individual organizations. Right. And in my case, that's Simone okay. Zajac Wealth Management and Lincoln F Investment, which is right. my broker dealer uh, based locally here in Fort Washington, Pennsylvania. So uh, with that being said, <laughs> we're all clear right now. Exactly. Yeah, so got we're going to have some fun. Yeah. So. so what are so. we seeing today? So, you know, yeah. one of the biggest things that we're talking to clients about today uh, and that we're seeing questions on mm -hmm. is the big transition stage into retirement. Right. A lot yeah. of people find us in their 40s, let's say age 45, 55, 65, sort of on the doorstep to retirement. Right. And they're asking questions about what is going to change as they go into those retirement years. So I would say big picture, that's what we're seeing. And I'm guessing that you see similar yeah. items out there. Yeah, we're, uh, we're typically seeing people, that, just like you said, between the ages of 45 and 65 mm -hmm. that have saved and uh, you know, they, 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 retirement is on the horizon. And a lot of times they don't, uh, they don't know how the pieces all fit together. And I guess one of the one of the areas I start with is uh, when you're planning, when you think about retirement, uh, like when you talk about retirement, um, I kind of equate it to a jigsaw puzzle. Mm -hmm. So if you do a jigsaw puzzle, I'll put it to you. What do you, what's the first thing you do when you do a jigsaw puzzle? You're going to go right to the corners that's, to get a little bit of uh, an anchor yep, there, right? <laughs> that's right. So I guess part of, you know, that, and that's what most people say. I guess it's kind of a trick question because really you, you look at the picture in the box and the picture in the box signifies where you see yourself in retirement. So we kind of talk about that first. And then, you know, what, a lot of times what we're helping clients with is understanding their different variables. You know, they, they have Social Security investments, things like that, expenses. And uh, we're doing planning on helping them understand how to you know, get to retirement. And then once in retirement, how do you make those assets uh, last for the rest of their lifetime? So that's a lot of, I think, what, what um, people are you know, typically coming in for. But like we were talking a little bit earlier, retirement's a lot more than that. So what are you seeing with, with regards to a lot more than that? Yeah, because a lot of times on this show, we talk a lot about the markets, the right. stock market, the bond market, what's going on economically, right? right. Today, I think we're going to focus a little bit more on that transition into the retirement yeah. years. So what I'm seeing is people trying to figure out a little bit about what they're going to do to fill all of their hours every day. Right. A little bit of a, you and I were talking before the show about right. people's identities, and for a long time it was their career or right. however they spent their time. And now, you know, when they go to the cocktail party, when they go meet some friends and someone mm -hmm. says, so what do you do? Tell me about you. Right. Sometimes they have to give that a little bit more thought and it can take yeah. some people aback a little bit about describing yeah. what they're doing day to day and, and you know, which hobbies to pursue or, or things like that. And, uh, so that's what yeah. we were talking about before the show is trying to figure out what it looks like. And that's a wide open uh, discussion about what do you mean? What does it even look like? Exactly. So what, one of the things that I, that I, I asked the clients to come in is, uh, you know, if you sleep eight hours a day, uh, you have 112 waking hours in a week. How are you going to fill that? And a lot of times it's filled with, uh, you, know, you know, five of those days was going to work. And um, kind of to your point, um, I, I guess I see it certainly with, with men that it's when they retire, you know, the, a lot of their identity is wrapped up in, in who they were with their occupation. So how do you go and replace some of those avenues, you know, um, with regards to, uh, you know, the, the social aspect, maybe the monetary aspect, the, uh, the, the meaning and purpose side of things. So it's really something that I think makes a lot of sense for people to think through before they, uh, before they retire. How are you going to replace that? So. Yeah, and I think that one of the ways that, that we should look at this, uh, when you and I, you know, do our more detailed financial plans right. for people to figure out how much they need in retirement, right? right? That's something big picture everyone knows they have to try and get their arms around. Mm -hmm. I like to separate that into two different things. What is the mm. minimum that you really need right. to retire, right? I mean, because there is a basic level of money 
that really gives us the comfort, you know, for the roof over your head, being able to eat and, and have heat in the house mm -hmm. and, and all of those basic things. So separate out what's our baseline for what I right. really do need to get by. But then there's the, you know, an ideal lifestyle that exactly. you'd like to have. So there's another yeah. number. It's a different number of how you'd like to live, how much right. travel you might like to do, what hobbies you'd like to engage in, right? So you're going to come up with a, a, a band, uh, yeah. you know, a lower and upper minimum and maximum mm -hmm. of where you might like to be in retirement. So I think spending some time and knowing what your range is now right. is the first step. But then figuring out when you're talking about how do we fill that space, what are we going right. to do with our time? You know, one example, I have a client that actually learned I learned a lot from. Really? He was thinking that, he was thinking about right. buying a car that he's had his eye yeah. on for a while. Now this was a decade or or maybe even yeah. two ago, but he had his eye on this car and was thinking about picking it up, but at the same time was going, you know, I'm about to retire. Do I really want to buy a new car? Mm -hmm. Whether you're paying for it in a lump sum or you'd have payments, he was hesitant. But he had worked in the insurance industry, actually, for his entire career. Right. So very different than the auto industry. But he was a car guy. He right. liked his cars, but he'd never really collected many mm -hmm. or done anything like that. So here was his plan. And frankly, it worked out great for yeah. him. He right. ended up working for the local car dealer wow, that had that? This, this make of car. Right. And he just worked part time. But he, be, he became a shuttle driver, if you will, for, for this dealer in driving their cars mm -hmm. from their extended lot over into their showroom right. lot back and forth all day every day and got to drive every model that this car nice. producer made and, and had. So he had, he had a lot of fun. There are a lot of, yep. a lot of boxes that we should check in retirement, right. not just the financial side. Exactly. Very important, but a little, you know, today we're right. focusing a little on the other stuff, if you right. will. Um, so he got to hang out with a lot of other mm -hmm. car people. He got to drive a lot of different models of this vehicle that he liked, including the one he had his eye on. Right. And you know, he made a little bit of money, right. which was good. I'm not sure if he needed it as much, yeah. but it never hurts to help supplement right. the financial side with some stability in there as well. Right. So when they took a trip a year, right. he did it with the modest amount of income he earned from driving these yeah. cars. So it wasn't all about any one aspect of this. Interesting. There were a lot of different areas that were rewarding. And by the way, at the end of it, he bought it at a dealer price, right, right. <laughs> um, and he did pick up that car in the end, but he did that for the first, oh, it had to be four or five years of his retirement, so it was just a great overall experience. So there's one of many examples. You yeah. know, Find something you love. You may or may not have done it for your career or been doing it for long, but it may be an opportunity to jump into a hobby that you've had or an yeah. interest that you've had, and whether it's a volunteer thing or it earns a little money for you, that really became a nice purpose in his life and why exactly. he got out. I think it was two or three days a week. It wasn't full time, yeah. just the right amount for someone who was transitioning into retirement. Right. So kind of like what you said, you know, it helped replace his social, you know, side of things. It, yeah. it, there was some income associated with it. It gave him meaning and purpose, and uh, um, you know, it, it gave him something to you know, you know, uh, drive to get up in the morning to, to look forward to and to do. So a lot of that stuff. You know, they had he, maybe he had his previous career, and now is you know it's a real smart way to replace that. So yeah, absolutely. So and, and there's a lot of talk these days yeah. too. As we record this today, there's a, a lot of buzz in the news about uh, some studies that recently were done mm -hmm. on blue zones. If you're familiar mm -hmm. with those around the world, mm -hmm. looking at areas where people have lots of longevity, especially right. scented genarians, right? And right. So there's a lot of discussion and analysis of why do they live so long? How do they live right. so long? And, there's a good focus on the diet. Mm -hmm. That's certainly part of it. Right. But what they have found is it's not just the diet. Right. It's the socialization that you mentioned right. in the, the story I told a minute ago. Right. It's it's being around people that have mm -hmm. similar interests. And it's also moving, doing right. stuff, whatever that is. We should be doing things that excite right. us every day. So all yeah. of those things were wrapped into the story I exactly. just told. Uh, and so right now the data is supporting that that's really good for us. Socialization, right. activity, finding right. something we love to get us up every day, whether we're, we're 65 or, mm -hmm. or 90. Yeah, and the other thing I'm seeing too is that uh, you know may maybe two decades ago they, there's this term cliff retirement where I, and where I know you know people would work for a company for I'll say 30 years and there's a line in the sand when that's it they're retired and they don't do any other work anymore. I think now just like you said more and more people are kind of phasing into retirement where they may not you know just leave an occupation and never work again. So that's part of, you know I think that's part of it too. Um, you know, and then also, you know, we're, we're living longer too. So, you know, how do you balance that with, uh, with um, making sure that you don't outlive your money? I know that's one of the big concerns that, that I hear clients say is that I don't want to outlive my money. So that's huge. We hear that all the time. And there's so many, you know, not to minimize the, the financial side of this sure. either, right, is there are a lot of things that we have to take mm -hmm. a hard look at right. in retirement. We've been talking about some of the ways you can fill in the social and maybe not expensive mm -hmm. ways, right? Volunteering is not particularly expensive. Right. Or getting a job somewhere part time right. is the opposite of expensive. You're earning a couple extra dollars. Yeah. But there are real expenses that we do have to take a hard look at. Absolutely. You know, you know living medical. longer, the medical right. expenses, uh, you know, 
not just the, the pharmaceutical expenses, but medical insurance itself. Mm -hmm. um, Helping kids or grandkids with college education right. is a topic. I don't know if that comes up for your clients. Well, oh, I can absolutely. guess that it does, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, let's talk that, uh, about that in a second. Um, but uh, you know what, what you said about about living longer. I mean, and the and the expenses. More and more families are also helping their their parents too. And, right. And uh, yeah, the expenses associated with that, and you know, helping them transition to the next living arrangement, whether it be. Um, you know, e either living with them or going to a continuous care retirement community or assisted living. I mean, that's all things too that is I think has changed at least from like when my grand, you know, from when my grandmother was was aging, from what I recall. Mm -hmm. So that's again a big burden on families too. It's it's starting to fold into the planning process too. Oh, it's complex to figure yeah. out who's going to be doing the care and yeah. when. And when we're done with this show, I have to make a phone call to a friend of mine who yeah. was born exactly 100 years ago wow. today. Wow, an octanarian. Absolutely. I can't, can't wait to chat with him yeah. real quick. He's doing well, but yeah. he needs different levels of care. He's right. got various. He's got a number of children, mm -hmm. but some help more than others. So figuring out who's going to do the care right. and planning all that out while it's easier before you need that care. Oh, yeah. Because how often do I see, and, and we both probably see people that try to make those plans once they need the help and it becomes much more complicated. Oh my goodness, you're and, absolutely right. So, yeah. I mean, if you can do it before you, before it's crisis, that, that's really the time to do it. Yeah. Um, and it just makes, it just so, relieves so much stress on, on the entire family. Yeah, so. so I would tell people to look at the different expenses, mm -hmm. look at, it, at what it's like to have in-home in care of mm -hmm. different levels, right. skilled care, nursing care. Uh, maybe you want to make some modifications to the home. Right. That might make more sense, uh, sense spending some money right. on that rather than moving somewhere. Or maybe it doesn't, yeah. but crunch lots of numbers, yeah. look at the whole range of expenses, because that, that's what it is, is there's a whole range of expenses depending on how much family help you get, how much skilled help you'll need. Uh, look at all those things with a, a hard pen and paper yeah. and calculator and figure out what the range is of what you can afford and what that looks like, and do it today. It's never too young. Those clients, you mentioned right. clients 45 to, to 65, for example, mm -hmm. when they first come to see us, even for the 45-year-olds, it's not too early to just run some numbers right. and see what that looks like if they live into their 90s, which like you said, more and more right. and more people are. Yeah, the one thing I heard uh, at, a, at a seminar I was at once kind of resonated with the you know the demographic that's like 70 plus. Is there's there's four things that are on their mind, um, and I've kind of kept this in the back of my mind. One is they don't want to run out of money. Mm -hmm. Second is they don't want to be, be a burden on their kids. Third is they want their life to have had meaning, and the fourth one is is you know something along you know spiritual. They, they want to go to heaven. So. Mm -hmm. I, I, that kind of resonated with me a lot of times, and a lot of times they don't want to ask for help, uh, um, but once you help, that that it resonates with them significantly. Um, you know, I've I've seen some clients that you know, they wanted to age in place, and one of the big reasons reflecting back on it is because they don't know how to transition from the house they raise their family to, you know, a continuous care retirement community, and. Uh, um, more times than not, it's something happens and then they have to, and then it's it's a lot of stress. So I don't know if you've seen that too or not. A absolutely, and yeah. you know that that's a lot of the work that I do is, is and there's a term for it these days in the industry. I mean, yeah. literally it's financial transition planning. Mm -hmm. uh, there's even a new designation out there, which we yeah. talked about a little, right. a certified financial transitionist. Uh, yeah. And I have that yeah. designation through the Sudden Money Institute. Yeah. Uh, or the Financial Transitionist mm -hmm. Institute, which is kind of a mouthful. Uh, right. I, and, and myself and my, my firm, my broker dealer, and mm -hmm. Simone Zajac Wealth Management, which is my, my local firm mm -hmm. here, uh, we're not affiliated with either of those organizations right. other than the fact that I'm a, me a paying member of them. Right. Uh, but those organizations do training for advisors mm -hmm. and they also are client facing to help people figure out what the transition stages yeah. look like, both monetarily, exactly. but also on that personal side, who's doing the care and, and mm -hmm. just thinking of the questions. Here's the hardest thing in transitions I, I don't know what I've forgotten to ask right and I think that's why you that's work with someone point. who's yeah, dealt with transitions absolutely. right yeah yeah and that you know I think the advisors that have that type of training are just going to become more and more valuable to you know to clients in the future absolutely yeah so well fantastic um, so um, we also uh, also talked a little bit about college that's one of the big areas that uh, um, that that's on our clients mind too and uh, Talk a little bit about some of the issues that you've seen with clients with regards to kids going to college. So absolutely, yeah. and I'm in the midst of it. And you are right, right now, right. absolutely. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know that. Yeah, I've right. got a senior in college right now, a sophomore in college, oh, wow. and then a high school sophomore as well. So not only have I lived it many, right. many times with clients, but at the same time, yeah, I'm right in the thick of that yeah. <laughs> personally. That's, well, that sounds good. 
So, um, um, and actually our, our guest coming up is going to talk, uh, is affiliated with college. Um, what else are you seeing, uh, what other things are you seeing from clients with regards to uh, transitioning that, that you, could, you could share? Um, anything? Yeah, I, I think that the number one thing that they're asking about is the, the finances and how to play out different scenarios. Mm -hmm. I think that's the most fun that I get out of my right. job is looking at scenario A versus B right. versus C. And they're saying, could I do this? Could right. I do that? So right. I think being able to be free, being able to not have the, the kids, uh, to be a burden on the kids, right. right? Am I able to not use the kids to lean on mm -hmm. later on in life? Uh, it doesn't mean that we won't, but just right. being able to scenario, role play, and play out those things and see how that it affects the numbers good. and imagine the different lifestyles. Yeah. That's the number one thing that I enjoy That's doing good. and clients really need. Yeah. So you ready for a question? Sure. Okay. Bring it on. All right. So we have a question from, from our audience. Uh, the question came in from Tim Welton of Ardmore. What are some defensive strategies for a downturn in the stock market? Oh, oh boy. That's always, that's always <laughs> a fun one. And the, yeah. <laughs> there are a lot of technical answers right. and strategies we could talk about, but they would be well beyond the scope of today's conversation. Exactly. So there are right. a lot of things they could look up more technically to yeah. do. Uh, I think that the, the answer I have to tell people, because I do see this mm -hmm. every day, is making sure if you're talking about a potential downturn someday, right. and someday we will see one. That's right? right. We don't know soon. We don't know later. But one thing we do know is that people need to be in the right portfolios or right level of aggressiveness mm -hmm. or conservatism with their money now. Right. You don't want to find out in the midst of a 2008, 2009 major downturn right. or even a minor downturn right. that you had more exposure than you thought that you did. So holistically, look at your portfolio. Work with your advisor to, I mentioned scenario mm -hmm. planning for retirement income. You know what? You can scenario play for downturns in the market as well. Mm -hmm. So understand what you have. How sensitive is it to the market? Do you have enough cash in reserves to live off of, first of all? Right. And maybe even do you have enough cash in reserves so that if and when we have a downturn, you could take advantage of it potentially yeah. That's too. That's right. right? So point. I think the number, th number one thing you want to do is understanding what you own today, what its sensitivity to change is like. Can you weather it? Because the number one way to, to get hurt in a downturn mm -hmm. is to have to change things right. to survive it. That you don't want to do. Yep. So know what you own and be ready for it financially so that you can take advantage, not run away from it. Good advice. So in order to, uh, here's um, how to send your questions to Money Matters. You can have your questions answered on Money Matters. Please go to our website, money-matterstv.com. On our homepage, click on the banner on the right that says, send us your questions. While you're on our website, you can find information about our hosts and guests, as well as show notes and links about this show and past shows. Money Matters is also available as a podcast on iTunes and Stitcher, so you can listen to Money Matters while you're on the go. That website address, again, is money, M-O-N-E-Y, dash matters, M-A-T-T-E-R-S-T-V dot com. Welcome back. We have a wonderful guest today. Her name is Mary Sheila McDonald. She's the Dean of LaSalle School of Business. Welcome. Thank you, Dave. Hi, Mike. Hi. Well, th thank, um, thanks for joining the show, and uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, um, originally from Philadelphia. Okay. I went to college uh, in New England, but I went to law school here at Temple, uh, proud uh, Temple University School of Law grad. And um, my path to higher ed is uh, a little bit unconventional. I am also a mother of four and grandmother wow. of two, Congrats. and so one of the ways I wanted <clears throat> to um, integrate my love of the law mm. and school was to become, at least in the beginning, a business law mm. professor, okay. and I was able to do that on more of a part-time basis, and then I got into college administration in a school of business, and i um, delighted to uh, head LaSalle University School of Business. I've been at LaSalle since 2011 and in the dean's role for three years. Well, congratulations. Well, what should some of the young people tell you? Uh, why should they study business? Can you give us a little overview? Well, yeah, even before I talk about why they should study business, I would love to just come back to several of the things that you two oh, gentlemen great. mentioned yeah, a right. few minutes ago. Great. Um, I love that you were talking about retirement, okay? So mm -hmm. from one end of the spectrum of people's lives to we're going to talk about young people, right? right. 16 or 17, you know, your, your youngest looking at college. Mm -hmm. And everyone... I think is looking for meaning and purpose, all right? right? And so I want to tie that into studying lots of things in college, but particularly business. And then Michael talked about transitioning mm -hmm. and transitions and transitioning from high school to college, particularly if you're going to live there, is a big deal. 
And then lastly, I was really interested in when Michael was discussing how you try to scenario or role play with your clients. And that's something I want to talk about uh, in the study of business. Okay. So there's lots of great business schools in the Philadelphia region, um, like LaSalle University. And particularly, we are one of um, accredited business schools, AACSB. And there's only 5% of them in, in the world. Mm -hmm. um, fortunately, for people who want to go to school in this area, there's a lot of them in Philadelphia, and LaSalle That's is great. one of them. So you have a lot of great choices. But why study business? Well, um, business is a practical um, uh, uh, curriculum. Of course, you will be steeped in the liberal arts in a school like LaSalle and mm -hmm. the other schools in our region. But, um, you know, people who are teaching in business school have to keep up with mm -hmm. all the changes in business. And there's lots of things to choose from, from accounting to marketing to analytics. Mm -hmm to finance, to international business, to management and leadership, or a number of combinations of those things, mm -hmm. which is very exciting. Right. Uh, so what, what is hot these days? What curriculums are hot? Um, analytics are very hot. Um, I think one of the reasons, a few years ago, there was a, 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 a popular movie, Moneyball, um, oh yeah, so, I remember you know, that. A great story. Yeah, yeah book it's a great as well. story. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you can either major in analytics or minor in it. Um, mm -hmm. It's a great um, combination with other majors. Mm -hmm. um, it might not sound very exciting, but um, majoring or minoring in insurance. We have an insurance um, minor, risk management mm. insurance minor. Accounting is the language of business, and a lot of times young people think, oh, it just means I have to be a CPA or go into public accounting, but that's not necessarily right. true. A lot of accountants go on to law school or become CFOs. Mm -hmm. uh, they can work in corporations. Marketing is wide open. Mm. Um, you know, marketing is everything from advertising to social media, um, listening and participating in social media. So there's lots of very interesting things to do and in, in study in business. And um, there's a lot of synergy um, in between the business disciplines. Right. How does how does a student decide if they're going to combine majors or do a major and a minor or you know, integrate different disciplines, like there's so much opportunity and different ways to do that. Are you seeing some value in going across disciplines or Absolutely. how would you even begin that big topic? Absolutely. For I mean, I think, um, you know, none of us should be one trick ponies. We might mm -hmm. wear a certain hat, but it is good to be have different lenses to see right. things through. And when people work in organizations, if they're working in a business, even though you might be the finance person, you have to talk to the people in marketing, mm -hmm. right? or the IT people. So it's helpful, and, and business schools actually steep you in all the disciplines first. You So any business major, like at LaSalle, everybody's taking management, marketing, um, statistics, finance, and then hmm. you decide, oh, I really was, really got excited about marketing or I really liked uh, analytics, then you pick your major. But you ask a lot of questions. Hmm. You know, I think it's really good to have this growth mindset, and we want, young people to not be afraid to explore, to discover, to do informational interviews. Um, you know, you talk about scenarios and role plays. One of the mm -hmm. very important things that um, I see is different from when maybe right. the three of us were in school is the importance of experiential learning right. and experiential opportunities, whether it's um, job shadowing someone. You can do that as early as a freshman, wow. to internships, co-ops, in, in informational interviews, uh, networking events that a lot of schools are mm -hmm. baking in to their extracurricular or co-curricular activities, or we at LaSalle have added a new required course in the sophomore year called Career and Professional Development. Because there are so many skills that even our uh, academic faculty um, can't, can't teach. For example, um, virtual interviews. I've never had to do a virtual interview. I've done, you know, virtual CLEs for, yeah. for law, you know, keeping up my law license. But a lot of times, employers, whether it's for a full-time job or for an internship, want to pre-screen people and they'll do a virtual or a phone interview. And we want to prep our students how, how to do that best. We're trying to teach them some very basic, what maybe older people would think are common sense things. Right. We're trying to bake it into the curriculum. That's great. So... Um, Talk a little bit about the MBA degree yeah. there. And, uh, you know, We're the saturated in our country with the MBA, and ironically, a lot of people don't know um, that the MBA was created decades ago for non-business students, okay? Hmm. It was for the liberal arts 
um, uh, graduates to then do a two-year MBA. And we certainly welcome that. Yeah. And a lot of employers love liberal arts students. Mm -hmm. They could be a history or English or philosophy major. Um, and uh, you can do a part-time or a full-time MBA. It actually is a very important value add to the, the, the skills that somebody from a liberal arts degree has. Mm -hmm. But also we see business students going on either right after for a fifth right. year for an MBA or a few years later. Because if you want to be a leader, a manager, mm -hmm. and go to the next level in your career, mm -hmm. you're going to need the MBA. And that will be a broader uh, education mm -hmm. for a, a person coming out of school. Interesting. You see a lot of many people coming back after being in the workforce? Taking MBA? For a few yeah. years. I mean, the the demographic for people getting their MBAs is getting younger and younger. Back in our generation, people went off to work for a few years and their employer had very generous um, tuition remission. They would pay um, a lot mm -hmm. for their, their um, employees to go back to right. school at night. Yep. Uh, we see that going, you know, shrinking a lot. But we do see younger people seeing the value that they can get um, a higher first uh, salary uh, if they get that MBA earlier on. As numbers people, you know, David and I both right. have to ask the question yeah. about sure. you know, return on investment. Yes. And you mentioned getting the value out of your education. Can you speak a little bit more about that? You just mentioned it a minute ago. Yes. I'm trying to ROI, think of how to quantify undergrad right. and MBA degrees. Yeah, well, I'll speak in general about a college education and a business uh, education. Um, it's still very much worth the long term, you know, it's a long term investment, right. okay? And, but there are, there are tips that I can give to make sure that a young man or woman and the parents who are guiding mm -hmm. them can make sure that the um, college student is getting mm -hmm. the best bang for their buck. You want to get to know your professors, your advisors. Come into it like with an exploratory mindset, a growth mindset. Mm -hmm. Um, and also get involved in activities or clubs that uh, you have a passion for. Mm. So whether it's a business fraternity or the analytics club or the American Marketing Association, those clubs and activities make the student mm -hmm. um, have some extra uh, opportunities to see the application of what they're doing. And then definitely pursue internships, co-ops, job shadowing, any of that, because maybe you find out you really didn't like that job shadowing, that, that particular industry. That's very valuable information for that young man or woman. That's great. Well, in the last couple of minutes that we have here, there are a couple of pitfalls you can, um, can uh, suggest to kind of avoid. Yeah. Well, um, <laughs> there's lots of pitfalls that I've seen in my many years yeah. um, in higher education, and they sound kind of simplistic go to class, mm, yeah. um, you know, a lot of people don't realize that when you're in high school, you're in class maybe six hours right. a day, five days a week, and if you're taking 15 credits in a semester, right. maybe it's five courses, three credits, you're only in class 15 credits, or mm, 15 hours, right. pardon me. So um, there has to be a lot of self-discipline, and we, we tell young people, if you can get yourself on a schedule, when I'm gonna work out, when I'm gonna have maybe lunch with my um, teammates, either um, on a club sport or, or you know, for this project, and get into a routine and, and don't, you know, put your head in, in under a pillow, so to speak. We're not gonna come knocking on your dorm mm -hmm. door to say, Oh, you missed yeah. class. Right. So I think there's a lot of self-discipline. And the transitions that you were talking about, right. where people are, are transitioning into retirement, mm -hmm. we do see that there can be pitfalls when somebody's not mature enough to see, wow, I have to be put my big boy and big girl pants that's on right. and, and be the adult now. Fantastic. Well, that's some really good advice. Well, that's about it uh, for, the, for the show today. Um, boy, a lot of good topics, a lot of great conversation. So... Um, uh, our, get, our next guest for the next show is Tara S. Nuren. She's an independent journalist, and uh, she's with eyesontheworld.us. So make sure to tune in for that. Thank you for, for watching us today, and it's because your money matters.